The Color of Beautiful Channel, along with Carrot Gnaw TV, presents Colorism Conversations, The Caribbean Perspective. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with this Colorism Conversation special. Colorism Conversations, The Caribbean Perspective. Right after this. so much. And then we have Ricardo. Please tell us where you're from and exactly what you do. Hi, good evening. I am Ricardo Mitchell, the social stage on the local stage. I am a, I guess I'm a media personality of sorts. I have a podcast uh, called Inquisitive Minds, and I also do a weekly radio program for the local radio station, WAC 90.1 FM, out of Trinidad and Tobago. So between I guess some communication, some graphics, and a lot of social work. I'm here to have a discussion with you guys about colorism. Great, thank you so much. And we are joined by my colleague from Exposure Network TV, Euthalia. And Euthalia is gonna take us into the conversation. Good evening, gentlemen. It's so lovely to see you all today. Yes, last week we had our ladies and they had a lot to say. So we're expecting the men to have so much more to say because the ladies spoke about you guys and colorism. So now we want to hear what you guys have to say about them. So to start off, we're just going to ask you, what are your experiences? What have you seen? What have you experienced yourself? What have you heard about that term colorism? How has it affected you? as you go along your journey in life, what have you seen? From since sometimes all the way back into childhood, some of us have experienced it. So um, let us tell us about it. Tell us what you've been through with this, this little thing that we have in our communities that we fail to talk about. So let's start with Neil. Okay. Um, colorism is a very interesting topic. Um, I think growing up in Belize, like so many other Caribbean um, places, very often, we don't think of our color, or at least in Belize, we don't. Um, but I think the first um, time I was really confronted with, you know, my color as my main descriptor was when I actually went away to study in the US and I was described as the black man, you know? And, you know, for me, I've always been William, but in Belize, of course, um, you know that you're black, but it's not the main thing because of the ethnic diversity that we have that you don't necessarily look first at color. But in all honesty, in retrospect, color has always been something that has been a part of my life and life in Belize. 
we know that certain people are considered red or you're, you're you know, or um, brown or you have some other color that describes you. Um, you're somewhere on the spectrum, the, the spectrum of color for black people. Um, it isn't always a bad thing. It's an interesting um, thing, but I think it talks about the narrative that we have as well. Um, being, you know, um, colonized, we know that the lighter skinned you are, supposedly the better you are. And that's a part of, you know, the reality that we have in the years. And so, you know, we have brown people and red people and, you know, everything and everybody was trying to, as much as possible, you have the conversations where people try to lighten their skin, so to speak, by marrying, you know, someone who is lighter and you were, you would hear that narrative. And, you know, as a child, you wouldn't quite understand it as a young adult, you start looking at it and sometimes without realizing, you also buy into that narrative. So I would say that's where, for me, it started. When I was in the US, you know, I didn't identify as a black American. So they had this other, and I started looking up, um, you know, the concept of other and realizing that perhaps that would be the best descriptor for me because I'm from the Caribbean. My experience is not like that of other blacks within the US, but I still identify as a black person. And um, sometimes it can be complicated, but you know, um, when you use the color of your skin um, and not your experiences, your ethnicity, where, you're, um, where you come from, you know, it becomes white, one kind of, um, I don't want to say whitewash, but one kind of uh, universal kind of descriptor that doesn't quite capture what my experience is as a black person. So I'll just start there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, um, Mr. Newton Ariste, I noticed you just came in. So would you mind telling us who you are and what your experience with colorism? You came in late. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Newton Ariste. Uh, my, I'm a marine biologist. Uh, I'm a marine biologist in the Caribbean. Um, and uh, I was listening to the brother from Belize and um, I, I have grown up in Barbados. I, I actually have lived and worked throughout the region. And uh, my first experience with, with, with color um, has been very subtle. Uh, it, it, growing up in Barbados is a very strange thing. There, there are um, people who are um, considered to be white from the um, plantocracy days. And, um, you know, you go to school with everyone and you line with everyone. But, um, you know, you, 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 you interact with them at school, but you don't interact with them outside of school. And um, they interact with their own circle. And uh, it, that was really an interesting um, time. But we all thought of it as normal. And um, it, it really, in, to my mind, never really um, got to me or led me to believe that I was different. My, my experience with, with it um, really occurred because we're really into a tourism aspect of things in, 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 in Barbados and the Caribbean. When you have a cruise ship coming in, you have a lot of folk come into the duty-free stores and you go to a store and, and you, 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 you're interested in purchasing something but if someone from a cruise ship comes comes in and they're a different color to you, you're basically not there. Um, you know, so so essentially, um, it, it's it is really about um, you not being uh, important enough for persons to to um, or customer service individuals to look at you um, when um, someone of a different color um actually um comes before before that but uh, i've had some experiences and and they've been interesting and, and and subtle um 
moving from the whole issue of uh, not being um, good enough or to be or, or to be paid the same as someone who's doing something similar uh, or the exact thing that you're, you're doing. Um, I've, I've had experiences uh, where um, persons consider people um, of my color to be lazy. And, um, and, and because of that, the, the belief is that you need to have more vision or that um, the, the work you do is, is, is substandard. Or in actual fact, one of the most interesting things that, that happens uh, around um, here, even in our region, is that you, if you're a consultant, you are paid a different scale um, to someone from outside and from a different color. Um, and that that just amazes me because you're doing the same work. So so that's where I'll just start. It's it, it's uh, it, but there are a number of complexities involved. Um, you know where you're from, um, and it's very subtle because we don't we don't speak about color because we're so familiar with with the fact that um, there are different shades of gray, um, so to speak within our, our, our spectrum, um, you know, here within the Caribbean, because of all of the, the, the intermingling that, that, that we, have, we have gone through over the years. So, so people very seldom speak about color in a very open and, and, and frank way. I'll, I'll, I'll start and stop there. Okay, thank you so very much, Ethan. And I actually can, you know, concur with you when it comes to the consultants. I mean, we go for consultants, we work as consultants, and they do get paid higher prices than us. Yes, they, they do the same work. In fact, sometimes they come down, and then we give them all the information. They write it down, and then they get paid more money than us, yeah? Or sometimes we get paid nothing for telling them. Or <laughs> basically, we do the work for them, yes? And I see Neil is nodding, yes, he's experienced it. Yes, and Mr. Ricardo, Richard. Oh, I know you can tell us so much. Tell us all, a lot of experiences. I know you have a lot of experiences. Yeah, so share some of them. Yeah. Please. Um, it's been interesting. My experiences with colorism have been very personal. I can't say that I've been the victim of systemic colorism or that I felt the pressure of it applied to me in the workplace and that type of thing. But in my formative years, I, I learned very, very quickly that I fell in the middle of a perceived spectrum. My sister, I have two elder sisters and a younger brother, and we are all different complexions. My elder sister is what you would call red skin, and my uh, younger brother is darker than I am. And this concept of us being, having different experiences because we were different complexions, I didn't appreciate it until I was an adult. As a teenager going into secondary school, uh, it's Trinidad. We, we generally describe people based on their appearances. I've been wearing glasses since I was eight years old. So I was glasses man, <laughs> four eyes, that type of thing. It was only when I got to secondary school, I was referred to as a browning or caramel. And then you would hear, and pardon me from, uh, I hope I'm not crossing any lines here, but colorism was so, is so uh, inexplicably tied to racism, inextricably rather, that I would look at an attractive young lady, and based on the culture at the time, we would describe her as a nice Chinese, a sweet Indian, a sweet Dogla, etc. And it got introduced at some point in time, the concept of she's a nice reds, or she's a nice browning, or she's a nice darkie. And it didn't sit right, but it was not problematic. As we got older, I realized that there was a term that kept recurring. And that's when it, it, it was a proper red flag that she real nice, far darky, or he real sweet, far darky, or um, his, your skin would be smooth because you're that dark and that type of thing. And it wasn't even about me. These are things that were being said to about and around friends and associates of different complexions. And it started occurring to me that why would somebody be something? Why would they be attractive for something, for a, a race or for a, a complexion? And then I got even more personal when in choosing partners, 
uh, or the people that you are attracted to, I've been told that, you know what, my complexion is nice, but my hair too hard. I've been told, I remember um, a young lady called me at night crying because she told me that she liked me, but she could never bring me home. I remember having my hair touched by relatives of ex-girlfriends. And, you know, it was a, a check as to whether or not I, I, I met some kind of approval or standard. And these things, they, each incident didn't feel that dramatic until you start looking at it in retrospect. And the concept of colorism is, again, tied to me in terms of hair texture. Because you know what would happen? I'd be on my way to work in a taxi. And at that time, I would have had my hair growing out. So I would have had twists or corkscrews or cane rows, corn rows, depend. And police would do a random search. And I would be the only person pulled out of the vehicle and searched. My bag search. I would have to produce identification to prove that I had a job and I was going to it. There were things that happened where in a maxi taxi, this is like a minibus of 12 to 20 people, police would only pull out guys who had long hair that was corkscrewed or cane road or, or bringing in a dread. So colorism, colorism for me was a, a gradual awakening to the premise that we have different Caribbean experiences, even different local experiences based on our complexion. So it was not something that I was aware of or was dramatically introduced to me. It was a gradual awakening. Wow, Ricardo, I mean, this is kind of, I mean, when you say that you're being pulled out of a vehicle because of your complexion, and I mean, because of your hair texture. And it reminds me of what we, um, one of the ladies from Suriname, when she talked about that it doesn't matter what color you are in Suriname, it's all about the hair. So if your hair not flowing or curly, it's a curly, like curly, like Indian looking curly, you're not, you're not it. So it, it's not about color for them, but the hair texture. But you're saying in Trinidad, it's both about hair texture and color. So if their hair, even if you have the color and your hair too hard, you can't go home to see daddy because daddy wouldn't want you to be with his daughter and that kind of stuff. Wow, very interesting. Now, Christopher, would you want to share your experience with us? My 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 experience with, with colorism started as a little boy. Um, I didn't know exactly what it was at the time, but it started <laughs> funny to see with my mom. My mom always felt that, you know, always referred to me as, as black as this and as black as that. And, you know, I, I always wondered why, you know, and then even going Growing up in the community, I, I, I realized people would always look, you know, look at me odd because of my complexion. At school, I remember one time there was this girl who, who, who started just all of a sudden, you know, quarreling, quarreling with me and telling me how my nose was flat and I'm black and as black as a black bird. And I always wondered why, you know. And I, I always realized, you know, in growing up, when I went to the banks, that most of the the persons, the tellers at the banks were more of a, of a lighter complexion. So, so, so that that has always been a, something that has that has been around around me up until today. If I begin to 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 be conscious of of my myself and to love my complexion when I begin to. To, to grow and read books that, especially from um, my first book was from um, the autobiography of, of, of Malcolm X and started reading a lot of Marcus Garvey. And that's when I, because I myself, because of what I'd gone through in the, in the past, really felt, you know, I, I bad about myself. I, I, for no reason, because every, it, it just seems that I was, I was somebody who somewhat of an outcast and people similar similar to me as well. So I always I always wondered why that was happening. And only recent in recent time I realized that, you know, it is something that was ingrained in the in the in the in the subconsciousness of my people where they they were they they were taught to love um strange strangers or people who have different color uh, and, and to hate themselves. That's why my mom 
behave like that. You know, I've learned to forgive her for that because she was really a part of the brainwashing and and and, and the, the the programming into into which went way back, which started way back from slavery. But these are some of the experiences I have. There are a lot more things that I could I could speak about, but I mean it doesn't really come up to mind. But it has always been something that has that has really you know led me to think that maybe I was I was not supposed to be part of this community or not until I I, I grew up and started to study and read for myself and realize that there was nothing wrong with me. I think I can stop here for now and allow somebody else to to give the experience. Thank you. That's amazing. That was absolutely amazing. We're gonna take a break and we'll be right back. This is yours truly, Ricardo Mitchell, the social stage on the local stage. This is my co-host, buddy, friend, pal. Yours truly, DJ Aaron 868. I'm always great and I'm never late. And we are welcoming you to the living room. It's on each and every Tuesday at 6 p.m. right here on the True Nation station, WACK 90.1 FM. So sit down and catch up with us as we have casual conversations on serious topics. Welcome back. We are back with Colorism Conversations, the Caribbean's perspective, and the men are talking. So what I'd, I'd like to know is, and it, it might probably, it might somewhat be the same, but here in the United States, colorism was a product of slavery. And, you know, Africans were brought here and the women were raped by the masters and then lighter skinned children were born. And, you know, they, they separated, they separated us by the lighter skinned children being in what they called the house and the darker skinned were in the field. So you had the house and the field, and there was a very distinctive difference between whether you were in the house or whether you were in the field. And it created that issue of colorism for what I'll call the African-American community here in the United States. So I'm curious as to, in the Caribbean, in your different places, how it seems that colorism came about and became an issue within your different your different places? I would say um, it's definitely born out of the same um, slavery and colonialism, you know, where um, the divide and conquer um, general rule of colonialism made it, you know, um, even among Black people, um, the different shades or even race or ethnicities became a part of it. And sometimes I would argue that within um, the Caribbean, we didn't look at it as colorism or anything because it was just a part of everything that surrounded us, you know, the narrative. And it, sometimes I think Christopher said it, you know, um, that it also comes from within your family, you know, your, your mom or your grandmother, you know, saying some of the same things. So you accept it almost as if though it's normal. In Belize, we are so diverse ethnically that we have, you know, Latinos, you know, Garifuna, you know, um, Creole, I am a, a Creole, you know, you have Mennonites, you have so many different races that everybody looks at each other. And sometimes we live in different parts of the country as well, and we speak different languages. And you may refer to them, you know, using terms that today would not be politically correct. But, you know, it was all a part of that insipid kind of, you know, um, racism and colorism and divisiveness that came along with colonialism that made it work because we could never come together and unify. We had to always be separate and not even equal. Um, Ricardo, would you like to go next? Sure. Well, Trinidad and Tobago, well, Trinidad in particular, is a little bit different from a lot of the Caribbean islands because we aren't heavily tourist-based. We are trade-based, and that is a reflection of our history. We've had settlers from uh, French, Spanish, Dutch. Uh, we've had migrant workers from the Syrian and Lebanese communities, Chinese. We've had indentured workers from India, etc. So this is on top of the uh, slave trade that occurred. We have a very diverse 
population. I'm pretty certain that I have to apologize for leaving out somebody in that list that I called just now. And our population is so diverse that we never really, believe it or not, found a way to unify. We have not had, we, we have cultural identities and we do have a cultural sense of self, but the colorism is so deeply ingrained in some of the cultures trying so hard to hold on to their histories and their traditions that they may not necessarily be receptive to uh, people from different ethnicities, different cultures. And it's not even on a personal level, it's just a preservation thing. Is it the best situation? No, uh, it is not. It is not, it is difficult at times. It is challenging. You know, a lot of these, uh, the, the, the divisiveness is introduced to us as we get older. It's not the type of thing that a lot of us experience as children. And even if it's introduced to us in the earlies, we don't recognize a lot of it until we get older. But again, I'm gonna reference uh, my teens and early twenties, my adolescents. You would be going to the nightclubs and there would be separate lines based on whether you're going to general or to VIP, literally just to charge you different prices to go in for everybody to mingle in the same club anyway. Or they would charge different prices for different patrons. So you might actually hear somebody directly in front of you get charged a different price to what you be in charge. And a lot of this didn't even seem problematic until, you know, people started speaking up and recognizing that, wait a minute, this is fundamentally wrong. Not because it's become normalized mean that it's acceptable. So Trinidad and Tobago is, is the result of a lot of different people laying claim to being Trinidadian and Tobagonian. And we have the colorism expresses itself in our inability to recognize everyone else as being equally Trinidadian. Okay, how about Newton? Hi, I, I would say that definitely um, the, the slavery, the historical issue of slavery has, has impacted um, our today in terms of how we are recognized and how we, um, we interact with people. I, I say that based on the experience I had, I, I had a, a, a girlfriend who was from um, the British Isles. And after many years of not living in Barbados, I, I came back with her. And it was amazing the way that I was looked at and the way she was looked at to the point where we became uncomfortable. And it was really strange because I'd never experienced it before. And, uh, you know, it had me thinking that um, the majority of the white or, or, or lighter skin individuals in Barbados come from a plantocracy background. They're descendants of persons who either own plantations or have worked or managed plantations. And so how people view the fact that here it is, I as a black man, was actually involved with someone who was white was totally different. And it, 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 it almost felt as if it was not supposed to be. So that, that, that actually made me quite uncomfortable. It made her quite uncomfortable. And, and we actually never did go back to Barbados together. Um, so I think that a lot of our um, present day experiences um, have that historical connection and um, influence, and it will take a very um, a long time for people to to educate themselves to to come out of that 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 thought and that that um, context and structure that that they're in. Christopher. Yeah. Well, uh, our situation in St. Lucia is, is um, primary, almost similar to that of Barbados, where most of the, the persons who, who own most of the lands and uh, uh, in the higher echelons of society, the judiciary, the lawyers, are uh, basically, they, they came from the front of the, yeah, and they are people of of color, or, or, you know, some of them, well, most people, are, uh, uh, you could say they are people of color. Of, of, um, I don't 
lighter skin. And they, they definitely are the, the ones who are more privileged in the group, where about say, maybe 80 to 90 percent of the, the population is, is predominantly black. But what, is, what has happened is over the, 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 the years is that, and, and that's what I've realized. Black populists have always, you know, felt, been felt comfortable as remaining who they are because of, as I said earlier, their their programming, and that is why I I experienced what I experienced as growing up as a child, because even people of the same color as you expect you to be, you know, to be not to achieve much. So you you always you know it was okay if um, somebody of, of of a lighter complexion but you know had you know attained a higher level in and that was also that was also um, permitted by by the society like because you have a lighter color and you come from a particular family you obviously excel in school and a lot of people end up not achieving their fullest academically because of that. So um, I feel that colorism has really, really played a role in keeping the black populace back in our society. So, um, right, thank you so much for that. And you know, one of the things too, that um, we do wanna discuss a little bit because the ladies discussed about, um, from a female perspective, about dating and being able to date and, and deal with many times not being the desirable because of the color of their skin. Now, um, this may be a little bit uncomfortable. I don't know. <laughs> you know, you guys tell us what you want to tell us, okay? <laughs> I know sometimes honesty can be a little difficult, right? But um, I really do want to kind of get your perspective on dating and and how it is to date when you're when you're dating and you're and you're looking at women of color. If that's who you who you date, and we're not we're not here to say anything about that. If that's who you date, but when when you are looking at dating or what interacting with women of color. How do how do you see women when it is any of your 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 target based on skin complexion is basically what I'm trying to say. Um, so this time we'll start with um, who wants to be on the hot seat first? <laughs> um, how about Ricardo? Let's talk to Ricardo. So tell us, Ricardo, about that was inevitable. So I have, I as a Trinbagonian, I believe that it, the, the people who have um, exclusive tastes are denying themselves a very rich intercultural experience. The fact remains that uh, I've been accused, be, I've been accused of not being interested in uh, afro Trin. Afro Trinbagonian women. I've been accused of not liking dark skinned women because I have dated women of every, every ethnicity that Trinidad and Tobago has to offer. In my younger days, I was uh, quite um, enthralled by the variety of beauty that our Twin Island Republic offers. And the thing is, people decide for you who you should be with. I remember being with an uh, East Indian young lady and walking into um, a food court. And I caught a number of glances from other East Indian young women who were thinking, who were looking at us like, what are they doing together? Why is she with this little black boy? And then I caught looks from black women who were thinking, watch him, he's a sellout. It was, I'm not even presuming that this is the type of thing that they are thinking. These are things that have been said to me. I have literally dated every possible ethnicity and complexion that Trinidad and Tobago has to offer. It is not a thing for me to decide who I'm attracted to or not based on the complexion. Right? I'm attracted to intelligence. 
and I'm attracted to confidence. Hey, the catch though. It is unfortunate, and this is a risk even saying this, but it is unfortunate that the black woman that I've been more seriously interested in did not take me seriously because they projected onto me that I was not really interested in black women. I was actually, I've, I've, I've been taken seriously, and the times that I've been taken seriously, I've actually had to navigate an insecurity that comes from feeling less attractive. And it is difficult to pour into someone who has an issue that you cannot help them resolve. Because it doesn't matter what you put into a relationship. Someone's uh, personal inadequacies, personal insecurities is something that you cannot fix for them. So it is unfortunate. But, and I can attest to the fact that some of my memories are based in the fact that these young, intelligent, attractive black women did not believe that they could be uh, as attractive or taken as seriously. So it's been interesting. Uh, the risk of getting in trouble, I'm not going to say much more on that particular topic, but the, the premise is that it's not just picking someone based on their complexion. A lot of the times, the recipient of your affections has things that they have to deal with as well. Wow. Wow. That was well said. That was really, that was really well said. Um, let's go to Christopher this time. Uh, yeah, um, what can I say? When I, when I was growing up and started dating, I, I always wanted to date a lighter skin girl, honestly. Um, I guess it's because of lack of, of, of knowledge of 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 um of the different personalities that person would have irrespective of their color and because of how i grew up with my community knowing that you know most people would go for a lighter skin person the lighter skin you would want you i wouldn't want to reproduce a dark skin person like me to go through what i go through so i'd want to definitely be somebody that has a lighter skin so that maybe when i have a child they might have a lighter complexion and the society might be a little bit more easy on them. Um, but as I grew and I began to understand, you know, that these 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 things were absolutely nonsense, I I, I began to see things different. Um, personally, I'd rather I'd, I'd rather be with a a with a a dark woman just like myself. But I ended up getting married to a, a East Indian a woman of East Indian descent, and it was problems for me as well because they, they, it was difficult for the family to accept me. And at that time, I was just um, becoming, uh, you know, accepting the Rastafarian faith, and that was a that was an even double trouble. So, um, but as as for me, I I have no problems with dating anybody else because I am ready right now. Um, well, from years go by, I, I have understood that I'm more interested in persons who are intellectually stimulating instead of just color or, or, or you know, their physical appearance. And that is the best thing for, you know, for our, our society, especially a, a society like ours that has so many different races, um, from East Indian to European to um, African. So I, I, I feel that we should be, you know, we should, one should date um, one based on, not their skin color, but on on their personality and, and, and things along those lines. We'll be right back after this message. The men are talking.
Hello, I'm Robin Williams, CEO of Ronage Movie Productions, and also the executive producer of the legendary Marion Williams documentary. We are glad to be a sponsor of the Color Beautiful channel here on Exposure Network TV. Thank you. Welcome back. We are back with colorism, the Caribbean perspective, and the men are talking. And so now we're going to go to Newton. In terms of dating, um, I, I I must say that I have always been attracted to intelligent uh, women. Um, yes. I appreciate the beauty of um, our black women and. Um, I was actually married to one of the darkest Trinidadian women that you could <laughs> you could find, and and people, as the brother from Trinidad uh, said, referred to her as smooth black. Um, we parted ways, and the most interesting thing is, and I lived in Trinidad for a while, so I understand the the whole cultural issue with black and, and Indian, and. Uh, my partner, my current partner, is uh, from East Indian descent. Um, and it is really strange because her mother and her father had an arranged marriage. And uh, she had never um, been involved in, with anyone who was not either very light <laughs> in complexion or Indian. So it was a bit of a strange thing uh, for her family to accept that um, suddenly um, she's involved with a big black <laughs> guy like me. Um, but eventually um, things just, you know, smoothed out and, um, and they're quite accepting because we have very beautiful um, mixed race um, little boy and it's their only grandchild and and i think that that has really pulled them together this very strange and interesting thing is that my grandmother who was very light in in, in complexion um from french creole descent um you know was not really in favor of um <laughs> me being involved with an east indian um uh, lady so it it's it's really strange but i would say that um you know, what is most attractive to me is a very intelligent um, woman who is confident and who who has the ability to, to, to speak um, to what she is and what she knows and um, is very confident in her skin. And that is the most attractive thing um, to me. Yes, that's that's great. You know, being intelligent is is important. It really is. Um, William, I think when you're when you're going through it as a teenager, you probably see it differently. I guess um, I'm one of the red skin guys, so I never really thought more about color. I think it was almost um, always more about hair. You know, you always hear, um, you know family saying don't darken your skin, lighten your hair, or that kind of narrative would be running in the background. So I think we're looking more at, you know, people from that point of view where you look at the hair texture. If you're going to reproduce, let's see how you can improve the hair. You know, you have a little color, how you can build on that. So I think that made it very interesting in that you'd have that narrative running in the background. Um, but choosing was more, I think, who, where you would be valued more. It wasn't um, necessarily um, always just um, me choosing, but looking at who wanted to choose me and for what reasons. So I think it was, it was more fun um, looking at it from that, that point of view, but maybe it's because I'm not considered very dark in terms of it. And I benefited from that kind of, you know, um, having 
options as opposed to um, being limited because of my color. So I'm very much um, aware of that, um, that the entire idea of hair and texture and also visibility, you know, um, how you could straddle um, different parts of the society itself. Because um, I went to an all boys school, so my education was considered more elitist, even though I grew up very poor, I could straddle that because some of my friends would be, you know, um, from that part of society. But then in my own neighborhood, I also had, you know, um, some expectations because I went to this elitist school and I benefited from that um, in a good way for me then. But it's only in retrospect that you can actually look at it and see all these layers and how um, the narrative or the tape, since we're older, you know, the tape running in your mind's eye um, sometimes affected what you did or didn't do and with whom, because that's just what was expected. And sometimes um, it starts within your family and then it, it expands out into what society allows you or doesn't allow you to do based on the commentary that you receive, um, which isn't always positive. It's more the negatives that, you know, really resonates with you. Wow, thank you so much. That, that was great. That was really great. Um, Nathalia. Yes, yes, yes I right. mean, yes, the men did me proud. They were honest, yes? Yes. <laughs> thank you so, yes. thank you so very much. I know you guys have had a lot of experience with this. I mean, of you trying to get um, partners and the parents not wanting you because you don't have the right head texture. You know, like they say it in St. Lucia, your plexion is too high. So <laughs> you you really can't even just enter the door. So I'm asking you now, you gentlemen, what do you think we can do to change that kind of thinking? What are the things that we can do? Give us some examples, some recommendations, things we can go to our community with, things we can tell our children, things we can do in schools. What are some other things that we can do to change that mindset because that mindset is killing us, is destroying our people, is preventing us from growing, growing, and we're being left behind because that's exactly what they wanted to do is divide and conquer. And we have allowed the division to go for way too long. So what can we do to go across those boundaries that have been left behind by slavery? Because basically all of those cultures came into the Caribbean because of slavery. What slavery has done, what, how could we reverse that and change the way we think about each other so that we all could just grow and live together and whichever partner we choose, whichever hair texture we have, whatever color we have, it doesn't matter. We're just people. So I'm um, you turn. Um, okay, let's go with, let's go with Newton first this time. But, um, when, when, when I consider this, I, I think that um, we must focus on, on our children. And uh, I have a five-year-old son, and I try to straddle the scene where he understands that, you know, we're all equal, um, we're all human, and to respect everyone and to treat everyone the way he would like to be treated. I try to emphasize that. And I believe that if we focus on the youth and we focus on the young people right now, that we could change, we could change the narrative. Um, we can actually say to them that they are important and they are valued. And and that is very, very important to me. And I think that's exactly where we, we have to start. We we have to, to to do this until we reach some sort of critical mass that will that would allow that change to, to, to take place. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It it really does start with, with our children. It really does. Um let's go with Christopher. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I definitely agree with that. I, I believe that the children 
are the instrument of change. And um, we, we need to start with them because I know for a fact that we won't be able to change some of the, the older ones who are already cooked. Like my mother, I mean, who is 70 some odd years, you can change her. So the, the children are definitely the ones that we need to target. And I mean, in, through, through what we're doing here now, open discussion, open, honest discussion about this, you know, the issues, what are we going through, the traumas that we've been through. Um, I believe our education system needs to be designed in a way to be able to, um, to, to, to educate our people different, our children as, as, as a matter of fact, to be able to see each other as equal. And the system m must change to be able to, like, to, to, to accommodate that kind of change. So I believe, that, you know, having more discussion, more programs like these, where ones and ones could come out and, and talk about their experiences and, and people will begin to see that there is a need to be able to make things different for the betterment of our, our community. Yes, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, how about this time we'll go with William. Um, I think the narrative that is running is very, very powerful. And we have to call it where we see it because that's important. That's, um, you know, you can't be a silent um, spectator in life. And as you see um, so many things happening, you know, you know that it's wrong. Um, because I think what we're able to do now is we weren't able to name it because in some cases we just didn't have the vocabulary to do so. Um, we didn't have the experience to do so. So many things limited what we were able to do with the information that had been given to us. You could recognize and sometimes you knew that it made you uncomfortable and that if you had to respond, that would be equally uncomfortable. So you would struggle with actually the confrontation of it um, wherever it is. Not that the confrontation is bad, but just calling it for what it is. So I think a big part of it is naming it and also having a conversation with people wherever they are. Um, because it's not about being right or wrong, but it's just making people more aware. If you have children, of course, it's raising them differently to understand that there's a space for them, that they need to be visible, they need to be heard, and they need to be com comfortable and confident that they matter. And, you know, sometimes um, growing up in Belize, where children are supposed to be seen and not heard, that kind of thing really impacts how they're able to claim their space in the world. I know it did for me. And so throwing off all the shackles, all the negative na narratives, and looking at yourself um, through a retelling, a re um, telling of your story of who you are and rewriting that narrative is very, very important. Education is important, but largely it must be something that you move out into society where people are able to have these difficult conversations and understand that, you know, um, not everyone is there yet, but we have to create the space to have the conversation. And I think that's a key thing for me. Just being a part of a panel like this, um, you can see that across the Caribbean, we all have the same narrative running. How do we change it? We have to do so whenever and wherever um, we encounter it, we have to confront it and do it in a way that is from a place of love and to get better because that's what is key. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Ricardo. So I'm going to apologize if I come across as less than politically correct right now. And well, hopefully uh, you don't have to edit it out, but here's what's going to happen, right? Love covers a multitude of sins. And there's a very amazing remedy for uh, traditional racism and exclusion called babies. 
I am sorry, but I've seen grandbabies, babies and grandbabies, change the hearts of people who have been set in their ways for decades. It is an amazing thing to see what love can do when it is not hindered in its growth. Uh, it's amazing to see how society itself is growing if that growth is not hindered by the things that we do in our homes. My suggestion would be to be as intentional as possible in our integrity. Because in Trinidad and Tobago, we have Diwali coming up. I can tell you about the Festival of Lights. I can tell you about Eid, Ulfitir, and Idolada. I could tell you about Chinese holidays. I could tell you about so many different things as a nation and as a culture. And I can appreciate that they've been, they, these things have been taught to me in school. I can appreciate that I have friends of different ethnicities and complexions and uh, economic and socio standards. I have to not just interact with them socially and publicly and training to the bone for the public eye, but when I go back home, I have to speak to my children properly. I have to talk to their friends with respect, not because one is dark skin, he can't sleep over, and because one is light skin, he asking when next he coming across. What I'm saying is we have to actively and intentionally be have some integrity about what it is we want for our kids. The kids know the right thing. They see each other. They see past what you look like. They see past what you sound like. And it's only being exposed to corruptions of that initial innocent love that turns them into us and the elders that we had to deal with. So what I would definitely attest to is, pardon me, but mixed babies, mixed babies are saving souls because they are softening the hearts of people who otherwise wouldn't have learned. Let kids explore. I'm not saying get them free reign. What I'm saying is that let kids explore. Right, to bring home somebody that you know nothing about, you know what that also means? There's languages you've never heard before, food you've never tried before, clothing you've never seen before. There are so, there's such a rich, diverse experience that is available to us just by, just by letting, just by letting. A lot of our growth together as communities is inevitable, you know, is that there are people who are intentionally trying to divide. So um, I, I pretty much suggest that we let some things happen. We let kids grow up and have friends of different ethnicities and complexions. We let our offspring date differently. You know what? For the adults listening and for those in our capacity to date, if you're already married or, you know, in one of those long-term situations or any situation, I'm a big fan of exclusivity. But if you're single and you have a type, the fact that you're single and have a type or dating and have a type means maybe a type not working. Think outside the box. Date, of a, be, date somebody from a different race or culture, ethnicity. Date somebody in a, you know, from a different country. What I'm saying is open your mind. Open your mind. It's only open minds could save this thing. It's only open minds could help us. So you want to go into a community? Yo, a lot of these kids were friends until we got in between them. A lot of these people would have dated and married and had babies and started businesses together if we didn't get any way. So I'm not so sure it's about what it is we should do. I think it's about what we should stop doing. But if we had to be positive and active about it, I would say let us be intentional. It's awesome. You guys have been amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I really want to thank you for being so open and honest with us here in this conversation. I do believe that it is conversation that makes the difference. And it is conversation that is going to get us to the place where we need to be, whether it be in the Caribbean or the United States or Europe or wherever it is, that it really is conversation. And like Ricardo said, it's about opening yourself up and talking to different people. I tell people all the time, you know, how do you, how do you even know? How are you willing to even have a conversation and explore a different culture? Understand where people are coming from, understand people's experiences. And until we are willing to do that, I think we're going to consider, we're going to still have the same issues that we have been having across this country, the Caribbean, and really the world if we don't get to a place where we start opening up and understanding one another and, and really being there for one another. I want to thank you all so much for this time. Ithalia, thank you.
for bringing us together again. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. It has been an amazing, amazing experience for me as I continue to bring light to colorism around the world. So the last thing we want to do is if anyone has wants to give information about how you can be reached or how people can follow you in your different businesses, you can feel free to do that at this time. Um, William, do you want to give us any, if you want to, you don't have to, you can just say thank you very much. <laughs> Leave me alone. No. Okay. <laughs> no, this has been a great experience. Okay. <laughs> no, this has been a great experience and, you know, meeting um, brothers across the Caribbean and, um, you know, just seeing how you can reason. And I, I like the fact that Ricardo spoke about being intentional, you know, because I think that's one of the things that is very important. Um, Newton and Chris, you know, just listening um, to you guys as well, you know, there are a lot of lessons and we realize that definitely we're more alike than different. Um, so I'm grateful, respect to all of you. Um, I'm more on Instagram um, than anything else. Um, one time is my name, W-A-N-T-I-M-E for my initials, William Arthur Neal. And um, I'd love to keep in touch with you. Peace. Awesome, thank you so much. Ricardo. Well, I am Ricardo Mitchell, the social stage on the local stage. Thanking you guys for joining us and reminding you guys that the hourglass is opaque. We don't know how much time remains. So whatever you're doing, be good and stay safe. But you. if you want to catch me, you could find me. Um, yeah, check me on Instagram, Ricardo Mitchell 868. And there you'll see links to my podcast, my radio program, and just a bunch of fun, hopefully positive and inspiring stuff. Awesome. So thanks Thank again you. for the experience. Thank you. We'll have to definitely check out your podcast. I look forward to that. Um, Newton. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, it, it was very enlightening, and I, I think that I was very surprised that, um, you know, even though we're so far apart, there's so many similarities. And I think this is a conversation that we need to have again. And I, I, I was thinking that one of the conversations that we should have about, uh, um, again or, or more about is, you know, about men, men's and men's health issues as well. You know, a lot of the times men don't want to speak about um, some uncomfortable truths. And I, I, I thank you, our host, for, for allowing us to, 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 to share some of those truths of our experiences uh, with you and, and, and our viewers. I am not on social media very much, but, um, you know, Euphalia has my contact and can get me at any point in time. And I'm, I'm, I'd really be interested in, in, in being part of um, the conversation. And I, you know, I, I really it. love that. I really love that you said that. And I think what we're going to do is make arrangements for you all to have um, a show, to do an episode on the channel with just you all, no women. Um, I think that if you all are open to that, I think it would be great for us to just do a show with you. We'll stay in the background and behave ourselves, <laughs> right? But I would love that. I think it would be an amazing thing to have just the men be on and talk about um, the things that, you know, you all are experiencing and what's happening in your world. I think that would be an amazing show. So hopefully we can talk about that and do that and just, you know, which, whoever wants to kind of be the moderator or however you want to do it, um, I think it would be an amazing thing for our audience to see. Thank you for that, Thank you. Newton. Christopher. Oh, yeah. Um, I'd like to say thank you, first to you, Fadia, for inviting me to this to this um, panel discussion. I really, I, I mean, it's nice meeting the brothers from across the islands. And I, I, I really hope that we could meet again in, in some other dis um, issues to deal with men, as, as the brother suggested. Thank you, Ms. Karen, again. And um, I, I'm, I'm on, I'm on um, Facebook. That's, and you find you can reach me as well. So my name is Christopher Wilson. Uh, I'm St. Lucia. That's basically it. I'm an agriculturist and a farmer. So if anybody has needs any expertise in that region, <laughs> I'm here. So thank you again for having me. Thank you so much. My sister, Euthalia. 
Yes, thank you everybody for being part of this show. It was, oh my goodness, it was overwhelming. I am very pleased that you were honest and you gave, you know, from your heart. So thank you so very much. And I, I know I'm going to see you all again, Ricardo, you know, and Neil, your turn, Christopher. You all got me and I got you guys. <laughs> all right, thanks again. Yeah. Thank you.